don't make it quote unquote our problem unless your partner explicitly wants that to be the case. Sometimes our partner will tell us something and they just want to be able to handle it on their own, but they want to tell us about it. This is an autonomy concern. When we handle our own problems, even for us, like there's a level of self-respect that comes with that. If your partner is not explicitly asking you to solve the problem for them, then don't. If they want your help in it, you can indicate to your partner that you do want to help with the problem solving. But until then, just like be willing to be a listener in the conversation. Be willing to just like listen in the room. Giving support means that we are showing genuine interest, right? We are being our partner's ally. So we're showing empathy. We are just like holding space for them. We're communicating understanding like, oh, I understand what the issue here is. Yeah, that's really unfortunate. Like, I would be upset too. Again, it's we against others. Never take the other person's side. Then solidarity. Like, this is our problem and we'll face it together. But I'm not going to solve it until you ask me in. Hi, and welcome to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast, episode number 100. I missed y'all last week, but I was recovering my voice and was going through some funk, so I did not get a chance to record, and I'm back with episode 100. I know, I keep promising this, like, epic episode that's going to come, and I've decided I'm no longer going to, like, create excitement about you know, a podcast, and then we never get to record it. So that being said, I wanted to share this podcast today to focus on love maps. Actually, the big thing that I want to focus on today is something that I talked about in my love maps, fondness, and admiration workshop. And I think it bears repeating, especially because Valentine's Day is around the corner. And I just wanted to have like this short conversation with you to kind of talk about what are love maps and like what are the friendship goals in a marriage. Hey mama, you deserve a life free of overwhelm and burnout. Welcome to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast. I'm your host, life and mindset coach, Shiro Bergbauer. I'm also a wife, mom, and CRNA. This is the podcast for high-achieving mamas in medicine like you and I. Together, we'll learn how to navigate the ups and downs of working motherhood. If you're looking to thrive in your relationships and overcome overwhelm in your motherhood, marriage, and medicine, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast. Basically, what love maps are, they're part of the seven principles for making marriage work. Now, the seven principles for making marriage work were created by the Gottman Institute based on research by doctors John and Julie Gottman in the Love Lab, where they observed multiple, multiple couples and watched their interactions and then kind of came up with, like, what are the seven things that actually make marriage work? And I'm going to tell you what they are. These are, one, enhancing your love maps, two, Nurture your fondness and admiration. Three, turn toward each other instead of away from each other. Four, let your partner influence you. Five, solve your solvable problems. Six, overcome gridlock. And seven, create shared meaning. So what Dr. John Gottman says is that love map is his term for that part of your brain where you store all the relevant information about your partner's life. So... If you think about it, there are some friendship goals in a relationship, and the first goal is to really understand and build your love maps. Like we talked about, just having that like information about your patient, uh, your, your patient, your partner. And the second one is turn towards your partner for bids of connection. When you think about love maps, right, the research shows that It's a very powerful predictor of relationship stability. And that is that whether a couple allocates cognitive room for their relationship and for the world of their partner. So the goal of love maps is to really build knowledge of your partner's internal world. And as we know, this is dynamic information. It changes from time to time. And so the goal of this is just like kind of have that baseline and then keep building into it. Love maps are really created by asking open-ended questions, right? So not yes and no questions, like more like questions which you would get more detailed responses and get to know a little bit more about each other. And 
like I said, it's dynamic. So it changes the way you move through time together, but that information may change over time. What the Gottman Institute basically came up with is that many married couples fall into a similar habit of inattention to the details of each other's life. So it's just a pattern we fall into. Um, you know, you're married, you have children, you know, life is going on, and we just fall into that pattern unconsciously. And so one of both or both partners may only have the sketchiest sense of what the other partner likes, what gives them joy, what do they dislike. What are they afraid of? What stresses them out? Now, emotionally intelligent couples who are what the Gottman Institute calls the masters of relationships, whose relationships have longevity, they are intimately familiar with each other's world. And what these couples have done that's different from those that are not masters is that they've created plenty of cognitive room for their marriage. So they want to know about each other's world. They are aware of what's happening in each other's world, and they ask questions, and they get information, and they're literally showing a vested interest in their partner's life. So they, they remember what the major events in each other's history are. They keep updating that information as facts and feelings of, you know, the, their partner's world changes. What the Gottman Institute found was that couples who have detailed love maps of each other are far better prepared to cope with stressful events and conflict. And we are talking about internal stressful events and also external issues. Like, so, for example, internal stressful events like maybe the illness of one of your partners or the illness of a child or the birth of a child that's complicated or a special needs child those kinds of things. And then external could be job stresses, in-law problems, problems with friendships outside of the marriage. One of the things, and I will link this in the show notes, some of the resources available to you to understand how to get to know your partner better is asking these open-ended questions. And so I will share some resources. One is the Gottman app, the Love Map Deck. And basically what the Love Map Deck is, it's an app, obviously. You can get it on the Google Play Store or the App Store. You pick a section, so it could be the Love Deck. And so you pick a section and it will say, for example, who's your partner's best friend? And you answer that. So you like you answer You do it with your partner, obviously, because you're building a map for each other. You answer that, and then, like, your partner would either correct you or give you more details. Now, the goal of this, again, is to gather information. So this is not the time for you to be like, you don't know about me. And this is, like, information gathering and, like, creating a conversation around around your relationship. The second tool is a book that Maggie Reyes wrote. Maggie, if you're not familiar with who Maggie Reyes is, she is a marriage life coach, somebody that I really, really admire and look up to. And she wrote, it's not really a book. It's it's a, it's a book, a journal of questions. And she actually just came out with a card deck for it. And it's called the Questions for Couples Journal. I will link that in the show notes too. But it's a great resource for maybe on a date night where you and your partner can maybe ask each other these questions. And some of the questions, like, you would be surprised, like, what the answers your partner might have. And some of them you're like, oh, I know. I know what's obvious, right? So just using that information to kind of create a stronger bond and to connect and to understand each other. Now, what I also wanted to say is, in terms of the love maps, one of the things that comes up in some of the groups that I'm in, especially around Valentine's Day, is love languages, you know, understanding each other's love language and should we take the test. Now, if you're not familiar with the, what the five love languages is, it was a concept created by Dr. Gary Chapman. And basically, he says, you know, there are five love languages. These are the ways in which we want to be loved and we want to be understood. They're a great tool. They are great information. They are great for connecting with your partner, and they are great for understanding each other. And these are words of affirmation, acts of service, gifts, quality time, and physical touch. Now, the reason I brought up the love languages here is because what I sometimes see is when partners use their love language against each other. So this can look like, oh, my love language is gifts, and it was Valentine's Day, and my husband didn't get me flowers. Or... My love language is acts of service, and it was Valentine's Day, and my wife didn't help me with some chores. And what I want to offer you is it is great to know each other's love language, but it's a tool. And so when you find yourself using your love language against your partner, it's actually detrimental to your relationship. So I'll give you an example in my own marriage. 
So one of the things that's very important to me is my birthday. And I like to give gifts and I like to receive gifts. And my husband does not care for gifts. He is not interested in gifts. He will literally be like, whatever gift you were going to get me, just buy yourself something. And in the beginning of our relationship, like, I didn't understand that. I was like, how can you not want a gift? Like, what is wrong with you? But also, because that was not his love language, he also wasn't apt to, like, purchasing gifts for me because it just didn't come as second nature. And so one day we had this conversation. And I was like, you know, my birthday is a big deal to me and I love gifts. And he was literally like, can you give me some ideas of some things that you would want? Now, some people may say, well, why can't he figure it out? I think this is where like the concept of not using that against each other comes in because it's not necessary for your partner to figure you out, quote unquote. I think it's important for your partner to get maybe... Uh, cheat codes to understanding you better, so to speak. So like sharing that information with him and like, you know, this is what I like. This is what I don't like. So if you are wanting to get flowers on Valentine's Day and you haven't said anything about wanting flowers on Valentine's Day, this is plenty of opportunity. You have about eight more days to ask for your flowers. So with that being said, I think it's important to maybe understand what your partner's love language is and what your love language is, but not to use that against each other. And the other thing to think about, too, is knowing each other's love language, right, it can change. It's very dynamic. I think, like, for me, even though gifts was a big primary one for me, when I had my daughter, acts of service became a big one and then words of affirmation. So I noticed that, like, with my daughter, I'm very clear about, like, affirming my love for her and affirming my love for my husband and telling my husband, like, you know, he's doing a great job and sharing that and and showing gratitude and being in the present moment. So quality time and physical touch are some of my husband's love languages. And so tuning into that, where am I not paying attention to that? Not so that I can then turn around and, you know, accuse my husband of not understanding my love language, but it just gives me information when maybe he comes up with a helpful complaint that we're not spending enough time together, then I can be like, yeah, of course, that's his love language. Like, how can I foster that, right? Or like, if I feel like he's not doing things for me, not to use that information against him. So that that was just a little you know, soapbox caveat, but I wanted to share that just so you kind of get that concept too. Like, why that is important. The second thing that I wanted to talk about is friendship goals in a relationship, and that is turning towards each other in moments of connection and the idea of the stress-reducing conversation. And why this is important is because there will be times our partners go through difficult times outside of our marriage. So maybe job stress. You know, at the time of this recording, there are concerns about a recession and economic downturn. And so that may be maybe causing you or your partner some distress that's out of the ordinary. And what the Gottman Institute found is that the greatest predictor of relationship relapse, like issues, relapsing of issues in a relationship, is how a couple handles external stress. So I want you to think about like something outside of your relationship that is stressful to your partner right now. It could be job related. It could be issues with extended family or some conflict dynamics with friend circles anything, whatever it might be. And I want you to think about how you would respond if your partner came home and maybe started complaining about something happened at work. One of the things that our brain likes to do is to go into problem-solving mode. So you will find yourself like wanting to fix the problem for your partner and like wanting to like help him navigate it. And one of the reasons this actually came up to me when I was preparing for the masterclass, I was thinking about how I was in a group and somebody came up and said, my husband has been very um, sad and he's going through some things and I just want to help him. And it's truly altruistic. We do want to help our partners. What I do notice, even for myself, in moments when I want to bypass my partner's emotional stress or distress, a lot of the time is because if they are distressed, I keep telling myself I need to help them solve it. I need to fix it for him. I need to help him feel better. And if he feels better, then I feel better because I don't have to solve for it. What usually happens when we do that is that we don't really offer the support that's being requested of us. And I recently had a conversation with somebody very close to me, and they said something to me that was so profound, and it was that 
at times when they have needed me, I did show up for them, but it wasn't in the way that they needed me. And one of the beauties of growing up and adulting and being open to like feedback in relationships is to be able to self-reflect and look at yourself in the mirror and say, okay, that makes sense. Like, yeah, maybe I have showed up for you, but was I being supportive or was I trying to bypass your emotional experience so that I can help you, quote unquote, feel better? So what I want you to think about is in a situation, the stress-reducing conversation is really being the best support you can give your partner is being his or her ally. So what does that even mean? There's five ways. And number one is being aware that your job is to show interest, right? So when your partner is maybe talking about the problem, notice if you are showing interest, notice if you're making eye contact, notice if you are you know, asking questions like, you know, show enough, show show your partner that you care. So ask questions to clarify. So it could look like, you know, what is this like for you? What do you feel about it? What's the worst part of this for you? What's upsetting you the most about this? Number two is expressing empathy. Now, I mentioned this conversation that I had with somebody very close to me. And one of the things was, I actually got to reflect on the difference between empathy and sympathy. And I think a lot of the time that gets caught up in between the lines because we think we're expressing empathy, but what we are really actually expressing is sympathy. So in empathy, the most important thing is that you try to put yourself in their shoes and feel at least part of what they're feeling and then express your compassion for them. Right. So maybe you've never had the job stress that your partner is describing, but maybe try to play that scenario in your head. What if you were up for a promotion? You didn't get the promotion. You felt like, you know, your manager was being unfair. How would it feel for you? So show up in that compassion. So when you want to express empathy, it can look like, oh, you must be so distraught about it or you must be so upset about that. Yeah, I'd be upset about that, too. Or that sounds really scary. Or like, I'd be very angry too. Like, you know, like really verbalizing back what they're saying. And that helps your partner feel less alone. And like you really, really get where they're living with the stress. And at first it might feel like unnatural or like artificial to say things like that. Because again, there are stock phrases, right? There are phrases that I'm offering you that don't sound like things you would say in the normal. But when we're learning a new communication skill that we haven't learned before, of course the words will sound fake until we get the hang of it. So then eventually your own words will come naturally to you, which is the best case scenario. Number three, this is super, super, super important, is side with your partner and not with the enemy. So when your partner complains about another person, Don't choose this time to be when you take the other person's side. Like that can look like, oh, let me just be devil's advocate here. This is not the time, right? Because your partner will now feel like they're being ganged upon on or attacked on or like insecure about being vulnerable with you. Later, they might actually find that as a reason not to confide in you. So always take your partner's side in an external conflict and I'll tell you why. Even if you agree with the issue that the other person has raised, you know, you can always empathize with your partner being chastised for that issue and save your own issues with your partner's, like, flaws. So, like, let's say your partner's boss is, like, you know, chastising him in front of his coworkers that he was late. And maybe your partner is chronically late. This is not the time for you to be like, yes, yeah, I always tell you to get places on time and I always tell you you're so disorganized. This is not the time. The time is for you to make this conversation not about you. Again, you're not going to be dishonest that you have an issue about your partner's, you know, tardiness or whatever. But we're just saying, like, you're not going to use this time to, like, you know, helping, like, you're not going to use this time to, like, prove your point. Like, oh, see, I always tell you, like, you should, you know, you should go to work on time. Like, this is not the time. Choose that moment to show empathy. So don't side with the other guy, right, and join in in the criticism. Empathize with your partner's feelings, even if it's not about the issue at hand itself. Number four, which we're so caught up trying to do as humans, is 
don't rush to solve the problem for your partner. Sometimes your partner wants to solve their own problems so they can feel that they're in charge of the situation, right? So they can be proud of themselves like, oh, I thought about the right solution and and I like I just want to run this by you. So don't come in with a solution. Don't be a super saver hoe. Like, just don't try to solve it for your partner. Just let your partner express what's going on and be open to like just receiving what they're sharing, right? Because many of us want when we feel our partners are feeling distressed, we want to jump in and help them. But just don't do it. Like don't do it. Don't. <laughs> just listen, like sit on your questions and, and and solutions instead just listen to your partner and give them the feeling that they are like processing this because a lot of the time, especially when we try to solve them, it may make our partner think, oh, so you don't think I know the answer to my problem. Like, you know, you can solve it better than me. So, you know, if your partner then asks, actually asks for you to help them problem solve, and that can be like, oh, what do you think I should do? Or, you know, I really need your advice on this. Then it's okay to jump in and, and give your suggestion. But until then, just don't try to rush to problem solve for your partner. Just let them have that experience for themselves and just, like, listen. Like, be an empathetic listener in this situation. Last but not least, don't make it quote unquote our problem unless your partner explicitly wants that to be the case. So listen, sometimes our partner will tell us something and they just want to be able to handle it on their own, but they want to tell us about it, right? This is an autonomy concern. And remember, one of the basic human like attachment needs is also just being able to be autonomous and make decisions for ourselves. So when we handle our own problems, even for us, like there's a level of self-respect that comes with that. So if your partner is not explicitly asking you to solve the problem for them, then don't. Like, just if they want your help in it, then it's fine. And then you can indicate to your partner that you do want to help with the problem solving. But until then, just, like, be willing to be a listener in the conversation. Be willing to just, like, listen in the room. Again, giving support means that we are showing genuine interest, right? Right. We are being our partner's ally. So we're showing empathy. We are just like holding space for them. We're communicating understanding like, oh, I understand what the issue here is. Like, yeah, that's really unfortunate. Like, I would be upset too, right? Again, it's we against others. Never take the other person's side. Then solidarity. Like, this is our problem and we'll solve it. We'll we'll face it together. But I'm not going to solve it until you ask me in. Provide affection and comfort. Like, if your partner is feeling distressed, like help them with your physio- physiological soothing. Be willing to to hold space for your partner and support them through a situation. I just thought that was important to cover as one episode because it, I wanted to give some more detail and background in order to give you just some ideas of what to do if your partner is going through something that is distressful for them. I think the the stress reducing conversation is just so important when our partners or we are going through something difficult. Like, and we can even offer that to our partner. Like, if we come with a problem and we just want to, like, you know, express it to our partner, we can say, hey, I have this problem. I just want to run it by you. I don't want a solution. I don't want you to fix it. I just want you to, like, help me understand. I just want you to, like, I want to run it through you, like, just so you know what's going on, okay? The last thing that I wanted to cover, because we talked about love maps, is what happens when you are feeling like the, there's it's difficult to connect and have friendship with your partner. And one of the things that I will offer you is coming up with something every day that you appreciate about your partner. And in the beginning, this may be difficult and you might feel overwhelmed trying to do it. But if you are invested in like recreating that Uh, fondness and admiration and connecting with your partner, it's important that you start to find things that are working in your relationship and just notice if you are always finding what's not working. Now, our brain is very, very much negative biased and it wants to like go into negative like you know, that feedback loop to find something wrong with our partner, how we need to fix them, how we need to solve problems for them. And notice when your brain offers you that, If you are in a situation where you just kind of feel like you're in the humdrum of like, oh, yeah, we're married, we have kids, and we just don't connect, and I don't cherish my partner, start to find one thing to be grateful for and express that to your partner. And it could literally be like, thank you for helping out with, you know, the dishes. Thank you for helping with bath time. 
Yes, I know. It sounds ridiculous. Why are we thanking our partner for helping us out? Because we should still be able to and willing to express gratitude for the things that they are doing right. So I may get some flack about this, like, oh, why are we just thanking them for just existing? But again, this podcast is geared towards you connecting with your partner and creating shared meaning and having fondness and admiration in your marriage. If this is not a goal for you, that's okay. However, if you are invested in trying to reconnect and trying to rekindle the flames of your fondness and admiration, it's important to be willing to do something that feels awkward and uncomfortable in order to create that genuine appreciation. Now, sometimes it's like basic things. And I'll tell you, like, I struggled with that in the beginning, just like showing appreciation, especially being fully aware of the mental load of parenting and the things, the running list that I'm going through in my head every day, right? So, of course, I'm like, if we start like keeping tabs and keeping receipts on who's doing more, your brain goes to the negative. And so when we notice what is working, what our partner is doing well, and we can express that to them, Like, there is a level of vulnerability that's associated with that. But, like, the end result is that we create this culture of fondness and admiration. And fondness and admiration is actually a key to preventing one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse from happening, which is contempt. When you are focusing on what your partner is doing right and how they show up, you know, in the relationship, then you're less likely to show contempt towards the relationship and towards them. So... Again, it could be basic examples. It's going to feel scripted when you're like, oh, thank you for, you know, helping out with parent-teacher conference. Thank you for helping out with pickup when I was running late. Thank you for, you know, taking my side with the conversation with your mom. Thank you for, you know, driving me to this place. Thank you for checking on my car because this literally happened to me this week where my car was just like acting up and I was like, I don't know what to do. And my husband was, I took my husband's car and he fixed my car and he's like showing so much concern about it that I'm like, maybe I should take it seriously. Um, Yeah, so it could be like, just like, thank you for comforting me. Thank you for spending time with me. Again, we are just coming up with things to remember how it feels to be in a relationship and to be appreciated and loved. So Again, it is simple. It is not easy. But I wanted to offer you these actionable steps because these are things that I offer my own one-on-one coaching clients. Like how do you then fan the flames of your relationship so that you can see where you sit in your fondness and admiration? Because I will say this, the Gottman Institute actually came up with this, that the best test of whether a couple still will still have functioning uh, a functioning fondness and admiration system is usually how they view their past And the key to doing this is scanning for qualities and actions that you can appreciate about your partner. Fondness and admiration are two of the most crucial elements in a rewarding and long-lasting romance. So if you are interested in a long-lasting and rewarding romance, then be willing to notice fondness and admiration and improve it in your relationship. Again, these everyday things that we say thank you for It's just to show appreciation and scanning for the qualities and actions that we appreciate from our partners. And maybe they can then start to mirror this towards us, right? Showing genuine appreciation is so, so important. It doesn't have to be a momentous thing. It just can be very simple, like, okay, I understand this and I like, I want to be, I want to practice it too. So Again, we have mirror neurons in our brain, and most human beings will start mirroring behavior that they see being offered to them because that's just how our brain works, okay? So my ask of you today is to find 10 qualities that you cherish in your partner and be willing to share that with them. That's the homework for this week. I never give you homework, but this is a homework for you because many couples don't realize that they're neglecting to cherish each other, and I think that's when the breakdown starts to happen especially when kids come in the picture and they start feeling like, you know, oh, but you know, why should I just thank you for existing? But I think it's important that we see that and we offer that to our partners and we share that with them. Again, a lot of this information is available in the seven principles for making marriage work. And I am a a course leader for that. And some of these concepts were more in detail that I learned in my level one and level two clinical training in Gottman Method Couples Therapy. So even though I don't do couples coaching, I use a lot of these concepts to help my one-on-one clients so that they can then go and practice them in their marriage and, you know, see the results. Again, I truly believe in the power of one. And so 
I wanted to understand these concepts in depth so that I can help my clients thrive. And I just love to see the work that they're doing in their own marriages and succeeding. So if this is you, if you are in a lull in your you know, love and your love maps and your fondness and admiration and you want to go deeper and you want to like spend the next six months working on your relationship with yourself, your relationship with your partner, your relationship with your kids. So your self-awareness, your self-compassion and taking that into your marriage, I can help you. I still have some openings for one-on-one coaching slots. So if you're interested, email me hello at stethoscopestoswaddles.com or I will link my Calendly link in the show notes and you can book a consult with me. And in this consult, we'll just kind of see what's working right now. We'll determine whether coaching is a good fit for you. We'll work on what's what you've tried that hasn't worked and what you haven't tried. And we can then map out a plan for the next six months to really create that relationship with yourself and then build that relationship with your partner and your kids to work on your marriage, motherhood, and your career. So I'd love to help you if this is something that you're open to. Again, I will include the information to book with me in the show notes. And I'll see you next week. Bye now. I'm Shira Bergbauer, and you've been listening to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast. New episodes are out every Monday. These episodes are created by me, Shira Bergbauer, and produced by Cassidy Mitchell. If you enjoyed this show or found it helpful, please rate it and review us on Apple Podcasts. The concepts I share on this podcast resonate with you or you're ready to change your relationships and mindset, I can help you. If you'd like in-depth, personalized support, I'd love to invite you to apply for my Life and Mindset coaching program. Just imagine you and I every week working together as I teach you the tools to up-level your life. To book your free one-hour consultation call, go to www dot stethoscopes to swaddles dot com forward slash consultation. You're doing a great job, Mama. Have a great week. Bye now.